Good morning. We are here today to discuss uh, future influencers and decision makers. Blogging, podcasting and other social media are profoundly disrupting uh, the way uh, influencers work. Social media and uh, um, exponential power of technology is indeed uh, changing who is influencing the world and how it is done. Uh, what does this do generally and more particularly in the humanitarian sector? To discuss this we have an exceptional panel and I'm not understating the exceptional here. An exceptional panel constituted of three <coughs> women leaders. I would note here uh, that uh, Davos uh, is bringing together about 20% of, of women. We uh, essentially do a 100% women panel. This is absolutely brilliant. The Sustainable Impact Hub is uh, showing the way. So, uh, first of all, I'd like uh, the three panelists to introduce themselves, perhaps in a few words, and then we will get into uh, questions, uh, discussion. So why don't we start with you, Jamila? Yeah, hello, thank you for, for inviting me to, here today. Well, my name is Jamila Mahmoud. I am the Under Secretary General uh, for Partnerships at the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. Brilliant. Lise, would you like to go? Thank you so much. I'm Lisa Kingo. Uh, I'm CEO and Executive uh, Director of the UN Global Compact, which is UN's initiative to bring companies into the UN and we have more than 10,000 companies that have joined up to the principles of the UN, human rights, environment, anti-corruption and labor rights, and of course, the sustainable development goals. Wonderful, very inspiring indeed. What about you, Kimberly? I'm Kimberly Geyer. I am a career banker turned strategic philanthropist, founding a group of women around the world, global women leaders, who are trying to bring their skills to solve humanitarian issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and for the sake of transparency, I'm Nicholas Snigley, I'm uh, the uh, Director General for Economic Development, Research and Innovation of CEF Geneva, formerly uh, having made uh, quite a bit of a career in uh, complex uh, negotiation dynamics management. So, let's start. First question, uh, who is the main disruptive influencer that you have met in your career, and what were the consequences? Why don't we start with you? Wow, I think um, the most disruptive <coughs> influencer I've met in my career are actually the young people coming through today. I think that the future influencers are um, the young people who actually want to give, uh, <coughs> they want hands-on, they want it to be part of their work, they want it to be part of themselves. And I think that they don't want to wait till they've made their money and retired and do an endowment. That's an old way of doing philanthropy. They want to start younger, they want to do it now, and the social media tools and the platforms and the technology we have today are allowing for that. And I think employers are also realizing that you know, it's actually something that is on the table when young people go to interview for jobs. They're actually asking the employers, what are you doing in this space? So it's becoming critical. And to me, they are the future and they are the, the employers that I'm meeting every day that I think are the most impactful. A sense of purpose is therefore absolutely essential. Absolutely essential. And, and part of them. Brilliant. Uh, Lise? What about you? Uh, well, I completely agree that the young people, the next generation, is an amazing group of influencers. But I also want to mention that businesses, companies, uh, company CEOs, I think have stepped up in an amazing way mm -hmm. to show the way forward. Uh, for example, on the Sustainable Development Goals, we have these 17 wonderful goals, and if you look at them a little bit more in detail, it's clear that these goals will never be made without a huge impact and huge activity from the private sector across the world. And in my daily job, I'm seeing CEOs stepping up, integrating the SDGs into their business strategy in an amazing way, really taking inspiration from the 2030 agenda to drive their business forward during the next decades and set a very disruptive and innovative agenda. 
Um, it can be in the energy space, for example, where I'm seeing companies completely shifting their business model and becoming only sustainable energy companies. I'm also seeing companies in the material space uh, transforming their products and business model to deliver biodegradable plastics that can be part of saving the emerging issue with plastics in the oceans that I think we are all very concerned about. So I think business is a true uh, change maker and what we really need uh, at a moment like this. We need many more companies to do that and I hope this interview can inspire many more businesses <laughs> to take a look at these beautiful 17 icons and think about how they can make the goals their own. Brilliant. I'm sure it will inspire people and I'm sure the CEOs you talk with understand that very clearly this is today's and tomorrow's competitive advantage, isn't it? It's absolutely true. I mean, it makes a huge impression <coughs> on business when all nations of the UN unanimously adopt first the 2030 Agenda and a couple of months later the Paris Climate Agreement. It's a clear signal from the government leaders of the world that this is the direction we want to take the world. And for business it's very useful to know what are the priorities going forward, what can we plan for, invest in, and sort of uh, really uh, which direction can we go. So both the climate agreement and the SDGs have really been taken on very positively. Splendid. Jamila. Well, it doesn't leave me with much, does it? I mean, I agree with completely with both of them. Uh, I think I want to talk about the who and the what. I think the, let's start with the what. I think the big what is actually this mobile phone. It's, it's not just, you know, the social media, but actually the mobile phone now being in everyone's hands, a lot of people's hands, let's put it this way, even in the most remote places in the world, that allows communication to mm -hmm. be two-way. So it can be a sophisticated use uh, with a smartphone or it can be a simple use. And we've seen this, uh, you know, with a lot of geopolitical shifts in, in the world. The who, I think, you know, I really do agree it's uh, <coughs> young people, but WHO has already redefined young people as anyone below 60. So, so I love it. So, in other words, you know, it's people who um, who want to exert their influence. And among, the, and I completely agree with you, Kimberly, is that young people are impatient. Uh, we have millennials who are in a instant gratification uh, mindset, which who require us to address some of the issues uh, quickly. <coughs> But the other group, very special group of young people, I would say, would be for us, the young people who are out there as volunteers, who are actually with communities, with, who are working in the most difficult circumstances, mm -hmm. circumstances and risking their lives, you know, to, to save others. And of course, young people who are influencers, who are, who are girls and women. We've seen, for example, how Malala has shifted the whole dialogue on education just by standing up and saying, you know, I, I'm a, a girl and I deserve education. And I think we are hearing a lot of these young people's voices coming up now. What, what I think the impact of that is that, you know, whether it's governments, whether it's a private sector, whether it's people like us who are in this sector, we need to sit up and listen. We need to be able to now, we need to shift the way we work in one that allows us to listen much better and then you know tailor our activities accordingly. The other problem though is that you know how do you discern noise from real information? And and, and when you have a, a flurry of activity on social media, on other platforms, you know, how do you get the voice that's really truly going to inspire us and influence us in moving forward on whether it's the SDGs or other things? Thank you so much. That brings me to the second question, and we shall now really uh, focus on the humanitarian sector. What are the challenges and opportunities for the humanitarian sector, given the change of influences? How essentially can the humanitarian sector take advantage of that? Mm -hmm. But what are also the dangers? Because you, you, you really spoken, and this is uh, brilliant, but you spoke about the positive side of this change. 
there is also a negative side to it, and there are dangers underlying. How how can we deal with these these things? Mm -hmm. Jamila, why don't we keep on? Yeah, I think I mentioned it earlier that you know there's a lot of noise in the background as well, and the, the young people, as I mentioned, are you know this whole instant gratification. They want to see it now, like done now, but not necessarily thinking through how do you combine the energy and the impatience of young people versus the wisdom of those who have experience, you know, finding that sweet spot and having that dialogue space. And so, so it's about intergenerational dialogue. I think that's critical for us to be able to get somewhere. How do we, in, how do we use these influences of young, the, the young people influences in a dialogue process with uh, intergenerational uh, leaders? So I think that's going to be critical, whether it's private sector or government or social leaders, right? I think the, the other danger is that, you know, you can get so much disruption that you become paralyzed because you know there's there's unrest and there's unhappiness and it's sometimes without reason right so so that that's one of the fears and the dangers but i think every every danger presents an opportunity for us and i must you know un un underline and really reiterate <coughs> the importance of the listening ability i think most of the time young people feel they're not listened to and I think we've got to change the way that whole area of governance, if you like, about how it's also bottom-up governance rather than just a top-down. Mm -hmm. The Greek philosopher Epictetus once said that we all have two ears and one mouth, and that this is to listen twice as much as we speak. Yes. <laughs> Perhaps these old principles should reacquire new Absolutely. meaning in, the, in, 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 in tomorrow's world. Absolutely. Thank you so okay. much. What about you? Well, um, I think it's, it's, it's a really interesting question and um, I want to start by just mentioning that in the UN Global Compact, we have for many years had a, a business platform, a program that we call Business for Peace. Mm -hmm. And the idea is to try to interest some of our companies in the humanitarian challenge and make companies think about <coughs> Is there anything in our business that we could, could use to contribute to the humani humanitarian challenge across the world? And how can we work in, work in uh, conflict zones, contributing to keeping the business going on in these parts of the world? So this piece of work has been very interesting. It has, of course, attracted attention among other UN agencies working in this area. And I think the challenge that we have a little bit at the moment in connecting business with the humanitarian challenge is to build bridge between the two and to explain in a better way to companies how is it that you can make a difference and why is the humanitarian challenges important for your company? Mm -hmm. uh, all companies today understand why the gender issue or the climate issue is responsible, is, is relevant for their business. But I see the humanitarian area as a new, how should I say, responsible business theme mm -hmm. that we need to frame better to really promote those partnerships that Goal 17 is talking about between business and the humanitarian sector. Because I think there's a lot of potential in this. I think it should be much more about partnerships, solving issues on the ground together, which is why we call our SDG campaign, Making Global Goals Local Business at the mm -hmm. Compact. Mm -hmm. So it's much more about working together in partnerships on the ground than companies making donations into the humanitarian mm -hmm. sector. Um, the, the, the real partnership agenda, I think, is what going, is going to change uh, big things going forward. That's going to be the um, interruption part of the agenda. And it could be anything from education of people uh, in refugee camps. It could be 
uh, the whole mobile sector that is so powerful, <coughs> it could be building up small markets that could keep the business going. So I think we have a wonderful risk that we can turn into a big opportunity when we begin to talk about partnering uh, on the humanitarian challenge with uh, businesses across the world. Thank you so much, Louise. Kimberly. Well, that's a perfect um, opening to what I wanted to talk about. And for me, I'll start with the dangers. I think the dangers are that the information overload, individuals feel like they can't contribute. It, it's hopeless. It's too much. There's, you know, it, it's too much noise. There's too many conflicts. How can I possibly do anything? It's hopeless. Mm -hmm. And so you have to give people a platform and a path and action because they'll get fatigued. Mm -hmm. And so if they've liked the Facebook post and they've done their crowdfunding and then they've, ex they've exhausted their financial resources, what else can they do depending on where they are in the world? They can't go over to Syria and help physically. What else can they do? What is in their toolkit? And partnering is hard. You know, businesses and humanitarian organizations are very different. And the group that I formed, Global Women Leaders, is trying to actually build that bridge through concrete action, through individuals one by one and coming together as a collective to show you can actually contribute. So in Jamila's example of young people being 60 and under, you know, we had a banker <coughs> who donated his time through our network to roll up his sleeves and help construct the first humanitarian impact bond, you know, pro bono. It doesn't have to just be lawyers. There are other people out there who can build that bridge. And it's difficult. And I think that businesses need to go in with their eyes open that it is going to be challenging. I mean, the humanitarian impact bond couldn't have picked a more difficult setting, conflict zones in Africa. <coughs> they did it, and they did it through partnership. And it only would have happened through partnership with private sector, with humanitarians, and with skilled individuals. And I think that is the future. I think that is the platform people are looking for. They are desperate to do something and will lose their attention if we don't give them a safe space to come together and test and know that sometimes things will work and sometimes things won't. But we all have to figure out how to do that. And I think businesses can help um, you know, provide ways for their employees to perhaps do more skilled volunteering beyond some of the things we've seen to date. Really, you know, something on the more technical side, whether it be IT or finance or marketing, there's lots of skills out there and we have to find a way to bring those to the table. It's not just about money. Very inspiring. And you spoke about the future, which leads me to my last question. Foresight, to, for which new way of influencing <coughs> society should the humanitarian sector be prepared for? How do we see into the future? Well, for me, I think it's partnership. Yeah. I think uh, partnership not only with business, but I think mm -hmm. partnership between humanitarian actors. Um, you know, it's it's going to take everyone working together, and, and you know, Jamila is probably a better place than I am to talk about this. But you know, we're going to have to get smarter about doing things together. Um, you know, there's only so much money out there, and and the solutions that are going to happen for famine, for natural disasters, for conflict are going to take the best minds, and they're going to take a collaborative approach to really tackle these huge problems. And having translators essentially linking people together because they won't necessarily always speak the same language. Absolutely. You, wherever you come from. There is a governance aspect to this. What is your take on that? Well, well, well my take is, I mean, what is the next generation business people? Where do we find them? That would find that would find it much more easy to partner up on the humanitarian challenge. We find these young people in the business schools and at the universities and other places, but they are at the business schools. And at the UN Global Compact, we have a wonderful initiative that is called Prime Principles for Responsible Investments. It's a huge network of business schools across the world. Um, they were actually just raided yesterday by Corporate Night, so you can even see how each of them are performing. Um, and I think this is a new area that we all need to put much more attention to. How do we make sure that young people at business schools are trained in sustainability in the humanitarian challenge, in climate? And how do we make sure that funding goes into the business schools so that there's actually opportunity for the students to research into these areas? I think we can do a lot more to up-qualify uh, the business school students to basically do what we are talking about here today. 
it's not fair to ask a group of young people to take on a huge task without actually supporting them mm -hmm. in how this should be done. So that would be my advice on how to take this agenda to the next step. Let's Brilliant. invest in uh, the business school students. Education and yes. change of culture. Yeah. Jamila. I'm going to sound very dark because you asked about futures and foresight. And I think the biggest problem we have today is everything we de design is based on the present. So whether we're looking at youth or whether we're looking at business and so forth. But the futures and the trends and the knowledge we have are showing us a very, very different future. It's showing us climate risk is going to get much worse. And therefore, the risk that we see today, the crisis that we see today, whether it's food insecurity, for the next 25 years, we're going to be stuck with it. And it's going to get worse and worse. We know, for example, that the uh, calorific intake for individuals and average will be much lower in the next 10 years, which means there's a real issue with food security. Automation, robotics, artificial intelligence, is going to replace a lot of jobs. So young people, the very same people I mentioned earlier who are our influencers are going to be very disenchanted, who are going to be looking for jobs, who are going to probably be unemployed and therefore become extremely restless. What does that mean for our world today? The third thing probably is that we need to look at you know, other influencers, like will the business take over from the humanitarian sector? Why not? We need to ask ourselves this question. Um, you know, A lot of the time, the humanitarian world works in a little bubble. It thinks that just by having agencies and just by having nice little partnerships is going to be enough. Will it be enough you know, 10, 20 years from now? In 2030, when we stand to deliver the SDGs, the world may be a very different place. So what I'm saying is we need to challenge ourselves that we have to look through a very different lens from now on. And I think you know part of the problem of having these goals is they're quite static, whereas the world may be a completely different place in, th in 20 years' time. And then moving very, very fast. And moving point. too fast. And, you know, change happens in an instant. I mean, yesterday we were talking in the blockchain session that many years ago, who would even think of www, the web, right? Think, how, how does it work? Today we're talking blockchain. In the next few webs, blockchain may be history. Something else will, will emerge. <coughs> you know, so, but what have we got to do? So then one thing is adaptability. I think the biggest skill we need to have as humanitarians, as private sector, as in everything, every skill that we have is adaptability. How do we adapt to a rapidly changing world? Mm -hmm. Right. We could talk about these subjects for hours. This is absolutely fascinating, but time is running out. I'd like to very warmly thank you for your inspiring words, for your inspiring work. Uh, very clearly, uh, there is going to be no shortage of, of challenges in the future. But as you essentially said, uh, we have to, we have a duty to transform these challenges into opportunities. This is what I retain from uh, your, your, your wise words. Uh, I would also note that very clearly science has now demonstrated that uh, societies which put women into forefront, which gives them a, change, a chance to really make a difference, have been much better in the long, in the long run. And I think you are a brilliant demonstration of, of what uh, this looks like, what it, it gives. A very powerful uh, message I also got from, from all of you is that nobody is too small to make a difference. But that we essentially have to step up when it comes to, to partnerships, to, to collaboration. And yes, we will probably have to morph into something new, reinvent ourselves. This is. Uh, the challenge, but also a great opportunity to deliver more and better in the future. With that, once again, thank you so much for your wisdom, for taking your time to, 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 to start to, to have this conversation here, and I'd like the audience to give you a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.